meeting is being recorded. <laughs> hello, hello, hello. Welcome to Only the Show. I'm Kelly. I'm here with my pal, Dino DeMuro. How are you, Dino? I'm doing good for the first thing in the morning, actually. <laughs> it's earlier there than it is here. You know, one thing I never could get used to was football coming on at like 10 a.m. <laughs> when I lived out west, you know, I just... It's it just seems to be a, like an afternoon activity to me. Yeah, kind of is. Yeah, but uh, anyways, Dino, I listened to your song, uh, the Beetle Bailey cover. I don't know the name of the song. I'm sorry. Uh, Beetle, what is it? Beetle's Secret Pack. <laughs> I should have made a note of that, but uh, I really love some of the sounds in in that song. Can you talk about making it? Well, it was inspired by um, the next album. I'm sorry, I have to backtrack a little bit. So I finished an al double album called, excuse me, I'm still getting over this cold, uh, Heat Stroke Alley. And that one's done. It's sitting there and it's finished. But my wife is going to do the cover. And since we moved and her studio wasn't ready, I, I wasn't able to put it out. And I'm happy to wait for whenever she's ready to do it. So meanwhile, I was working on a second uh, follow-up called Machine, which is based on drum loops, drum machines, edited drums. And there was a song by a band I really love called the Civil, uh, the band's called The Civil Union. And in the opening of that song, they had this great drum uh, program uh, uh, edit, uh, drum machine edit. And so I was able to take that section and stretch it out for an entire length of the song. So that's how it started, was just their drum track. Then I went over, then it was time to get out my keyboards and start, because I was writing too much on guitar. So I thought I got to start writing on keyboards again. So then I just started, you know, improvising and playing and seeing what I could come up with over that beat. And so then I kept the best stuff and refined it. And then I added guitar and bass. And so that's basically what that is. And, and it was supposed to go on machine, but then Heat Stroke Alley was almost done. And I went, you know what, this, this album really could use a keyboard song. So I just, I pulled it backwards and put it into Heat Stroke Alley. But since Heat Stroke is not out, I, <laughs> no one's really hearing it. So I thought, okay, I'm gonna release it now. Dino, you seem like a natural born cataloger kind of personality to me. Am I off base there? I mean, you seem to have collections or of tapes that you talk about sometimes, and there's references from one album to another. Uh, I mean, do you think, would you consider yourself a catalog type of personality? Oh yeah. Yeah, I still have somewhere around here, I still have a big binder with like the very first cassettes I made with listings of the so-called songs on each one. And it's not, it's not complete in, by any stretch, but the really important ones I went through, drew pictures at the top. And, and my friend John, who was my partner, would visit sometimes and he'd take it down and he'd go, oh, my, it would be going memory lane for him, you know, because it goes back to 1970. So yeah, I definitely a catalog kind of guy. And all my, you can't see it, but all my cassettes are in that closet back there in bins, plastic bins. Do you think that that um, comes through in your music somehow, maybe as far as the way you process what's going on and how it comes out? I mean, uh, because I, I swear to gosh, Dino, it's like listening to your records is like, partaking on an inside joke <laughs> well that's great that's kind of what i want um yeah definitely because um well when you say phases to me i always thought of phases as what what equipment do i have now or what's my drum set up or so you know there was an era where i had live drummers <clears throat> well i started with really primitive drum machine so that was an era drum primitive moog synthesizer and then i got a digital synthesizer and a real drummer so that was another era then i went back to drum machines again but i had 
better keyboards, better guitars. So yeah, I kind of think of it as whatever, like here's my new Elisa's keyboard right here. So whatever instrument I'm currently really into, that kind of, that'll kind of uh, make the road for me that I'm on. It'll predict what, the direction I'm going. Do you, are you like me in that you find yourself changing your parameters in hopes to change uh, what comes out? Oh, yeah. Because, you know, Heat Stroke Alley, I I personally love it. But when, I, when it was all coming together, I thought, you know, this is yet another album based on 20 years of guitar riffs that I, because there was a long period where I couldn't make albums. I was... I was working too much. I had the family. My wife was giving me, my, my first wife was giving me static. And I thought, well, at least I can make demos. No one can stop me from doing that. So every, you know, at work, if I had a, if I got an idea or if I had a break, I would just pick up my, my uh, uh, Stratocaster and my little Walkman and, and make riffs. So I've got hundreds of hours of those things. And so my yeah. last, so once I started recording albums again, I started collating those um demo tapes and i'm like oh this is i've his treasure chest full of riffs this is great but by the time i made heat stroke alley i went you know these are all starting to sound like guitar based songs or riff based and kind of short and, and and i used to have a whole keyboard thing that i did i was kind of known for um so that's why you know i got the new 88 key uh, keyboard because I went it's time for me to change up the sound I really need to get away from those riffs for a while and get more of a piano sound piano composition because I I write differently on the piano for sure and that and you know Beatle was one of the, was one of the first when <clears throat> excuse me I've been doing so many interviews I'm gonna get hoarse uh but <laughs> when you started out uh or what got you started in music? We know what got you started with sound effects and the sound and you hearing the sounds at an early age and wanting to, you know, record them and manipulate them or whatever. But what got the, what was the, do you remember a musical moment that got you, that made you go, yeah, that's, that's where I'm headed? Well, the absolute earliest was Bonnie and Clyde. And I was, my sister took me to it when it came out like in 1968 and I was really, I was too young really. Cause I'd never seen a movie with that kind of violence. And actually adults were freaked out by that movie too, at the time, you know, like <laughs> it's too violent. This is sick. What's going on here with cinema, you know, the new modern gory cinema. And I'm a kid going, Oh, that guy just got shot in the face. Well, behind them, Every time they're going away in their jalopies, I'm hearing Latin scrug. And I just, I totally fell in love with that sound. And, you know, when you look at modern banjo play or, you know, other banjo players who play in that style, they all point to Scruggs. They all had that same reaction that I did, that they just absolutely wanted to learn that. Um, and I got the Scruggs book. I got, you know, uh, I really tried to learn his style and I only ever learned it like minus 200 speed or so. I can go, <laughs> dar, 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 dar. that's as fast as I can go. But I fake it on the on my song, so just I love the sound anyway. I don't care that I can't actually play the banjo. I just love banjo. That is a good segue into the next. I wanted to talk about all the things you do and instruments you play, and how. I mean, along with being a musician, you're a gifted editor, and I just wanted you to talk about maybe the process of making a song and the instruments you might incorporate in doing so. Um, let's see. Well, I have to say that I think of everything that I do, like I would not say I'm a great guitar player. I know I have a certain level that if I really practice, I get to a pretty good level. Um, keyboards, I'm really not that great. But what I am great at and, and I'm not ashamed to say it is editing. And that has to, that goes for sound editing, which was my job for years, uh, song editing, uh, picture editing, even text editing. That's, I, I just have the mind of an editor. And I think the, one of the reasons is when I took filmmaking classes as a kid, 
so much of my footage was shaky and crappy and out of focus that before I showed it to anybody, I went, I have to cut out all the bad stuff, you know? So that trained me. So then I would show people, they go, whoa, that's great. And I go, God, you have no idea. What <laughs> you didn't see. So music's the same thing. It's like people constantly say, how do you do it? And you're so fluid and you have chops. And I'm like, I don't have any chops. Like you put me on the stage right now and people, in fact, when I first took, I had taken piano lessons when I with my, from my grandmother when I was like five. But then in my early 30s, I, I wanted to learn like jazz voicings on piano. I want, or no, I wanted to learn, yeah, kind of a jazz style on piano. I wanted to sort of learn more of what I was trying to do. And I played my new teacher one of my songs and he got all excited and he goes, oh my God, could you play this? Could you play? And he gets out this sheet, Beethoven sheet music. And I go, well, maybe if you give me a little time. And he goes, well, just play something. And I go, dun, 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 dun. And his face went. <laughs> and he goes, well, clearly you're a really good at <laughs> It was so embarrassing because, you know, I couldn't play. So I learned yeah. a little from him. But yeah, that's so. So to answer your question, which I guess I haven't done, um, the editing, I'll, I'll try to think, I'll try to imagine what I want to do with a song and do as much as I can with my own abilities. But then the editing is another, at least half of it, if not more. Because and, and, and a lot of times I think, you know, if I just learned to play these damn instruments, maybe I wouldn't have to spend so much time editing. But I don't know if even then, if I played better, I don't know if I would even spend less time because I can't stop myself from going in and, oh, that note's wrong and cutting and pasting the correct note. And, oh, that transition. And this, I played it much better here. So I'm moving it over here. And when I hear your music, it's I go, God, those are people that can play. It's like, what? <laughs> you know? <laughs> I, I don't i don't i don't know about that dito i i listen to your music and i i think you i think you can play yeah that's because i'm an editor <laughs> 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 and people go we have to have a live show for the indie hunt people like oh crap i'll be in the woodshed for two years before i can do that yeah, yeah, I'm in the same boat there. It's been so long. It's it's been since before COVID since we played a gig. Oh, no, 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 no. We played one in we played one in New York City. And then before that it was since before COVID. Is that the one with the video? The fa the famous video of you on stage? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah, that's really good. That's yeah, see that's the kind of thing I'm like, God, I can't even imagine. <laughs> You know, I mean, I have played live. Like you probably know the story that I opened for Van, my band opened for Van Halen one year, and you know that's an old, dusty story. But yeah, I, I used to play all the time. I played live constantly. Um, so maybe it wouldn't take that much longer to learn. But but you know, I just love making these songs and putting them together so much that if I just get just enough to make them work. Then I go, okay, I'm done recording. Now it's time to, to piece it all together. And then that's, that's the part that really excites me. So, oh, see, I'm the opposite. I spend forever and ever recording. And then I get about halfway into the mixing and I'm like, I need a mixer. That's. <laughs> and, I, and I send it to a mixer. So. Sure. But, uh, but yeah, I'll spend 11 months. I spent 11 months recording Ramsey's. Ooh, wow wow well that's the only way to do it <laughs> it's like 11 months editing or 11 months recording it's take your pick <laughs> yeah because i know? oh go ahead no i was just gonna say in a way it's 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 not the most ideal way to work because like i have machine and on my um i on my iphone and I listen to it when I go on my walks, if I'm not reviewing another album or something, I'll listen to it in progress. And I'll go, God, then it's halfway there. I just got to fix this, fix this, that, fix that. But what happens is I get to know my own album so well that by the time it comes out, it's like, oh, like I've heard this a thousand times, you know, and it, I'd like it to be a little more fresh for me. But again, it's like I am who I am. And it, it's really hard to do it differently than the way that I've always done it.
I found the solution for me for that was to get outside mixing on my own material. Mm-hmm. And I like it just like anybody else's material. Uh, that, But you're so good at mixing, there's no reason for you to do that. So... Yeah, and you know what you call mixing, I think for me, it's like by the time I get it ready for what other people would call mixing, it's kind of mixed itself. Like, I don't know, I, I remember maybe it was Brian Lambert or somebody was saying half of mixing is making sure the elements are right ahead of time, not just here's a bunch of elements, go mix them. You know, like if you're along the way, if you're making sure things have the right tonality and the right EQ and everything, once you mix it, it goes a lot easier. So I think my songs almost mix themselves like my first album my first cd after i had this long period where i was uh where i couldn't be releasing um i actually sent it to a friend of mine to master and he said first of all he said it's too hot i can't there's not enough headroom to master but then he said sounds good to me i would just put it out the way it is and so that's what i did and i really can't it doesn't sound bad to me either you know so is that the bailey song I'm sorry. Is that the ba- is that the Bailey's song? No, it's an album called "I Don't Know Tomorrow." Mm. Um, that came out about three and a half. It was the first album I made after um, I had um, moved out of my old house and moved in with Sharon and got my new computer set at Gower. I'm sorry, you know, and it was actually after I retired from sound editing from cable sound editing. So I got the new Pro Tools, and that was here's going to be my first album. And he said it. He said it sounded fine. So now I kind of I master some songs, um, but what I for me mastering it's gotten down to here's my version. Here is like the e mastered version. Is the e mastered version better in any way? If it is, can it be even better than that? If not. Um, like I did a whole album of guitar solos, but the the guitar parts were all like kind of low, recorded kind of low. And the E master totally saved that out because otherwise, you know, the just the levels compared to other songs would have been way, way off. And so when I A B those, I'm like, oh, there's no question that these are better. But then on other songs that are super that are just like pushing the red and and just going full bore. Like you try to master it, and it's like, no, it's not at it's just making it noisy. It's just just slamming the thing to the into the red. So Yeah, I, I always send my tracks at minus six dB. It I'm just used to that's just what I'm used to doing, you know. Yeah. Uh, I, I've never done that. <laughs> and people <laughs> get go, crap, how do you get this so loud? You know, because <laughs> I don't know what I'm doing, I guess. <laughs> <laughs> oh, on the other hand, I don't have to do much yet because if I can't do anything else to it because it's so it's already right there. I know I've you know and I've tried to do it the right way and I I just can't. I'm just like as long as these songs you know no one's ever jumped up at me and said this is technically wrong. This doesn't sound right. I mean literally nobody has said that to me. And as soon as someone does, I probably like sit up straight and go shit. What do I do now? But since I never hear that, I go well I'll just keep going. You know why, why not? Yeah, yeah. Uh, Our host had uh, similar experiences with his music. With who, mixed host, the host, yeah, with some of his songs, his early mixes, people were giving him um, suggestions and things, and um, but then he realized they were actually fine, and people were just nitpicking. Yeah. Or he was actually closer to it being being right than he wasn't. Yeah. I don't, I don't want to speak for him, but that's kind of the lesson I got from that. You know, what happens as a musician so often is uh, people think you're new and they hear a song that you did uh, and they want to give you advice, not realizing it's like the 300th song you've done over the course of 15 to 20 years. Have you experienced this? Oh, yeah. Oh, yeah. Yeah, usually. And usually it's trolls like. You know, like if you listen to something of mine, you kind of need a little, you kind of just can't jump in and assume it's going to be like ABBA or something. And, and so somebody will, especially YouTube, people seem to like randomly click on a song of mine on YouTube and they'll go, dude, your song is not good. <laughs> <laughs> oh, no. 
Um, and you know, what do I do? What do I do? <laughs> as far as he's concerned, that that for him, that's that's correct. It's not good, maybe for him. But if you kind of if you come from the indie music uh, ethos or the cassette, uh, you know, the homemade artist ethos, then maybe I am okay. You know, that's you need the context. So yeah, I mostly get that from people that don't have the context. And and I'm sorry, could I tell you a story real quick? Because it's kind of funny. Please do. Go ahead. So, because you made me think of this. So, years and years ago, when I was still um, record, uh, releasing cassettes, I was about to go on a on a train trip, and I was over at my friend's house, Tom, and his sister came in, and she said, "So, you're going on this train trip? Do you, you know, do you take anything with you?" And I go, "Oh, well, I have a bunch of music cassettes that I have. I have REM, I have Beethoven, I have this, I have that, and I go. Plus, I take a couple of my own." And she goes, "What?" And I said, yeah, you know, my music. And she thought I meant that I just picked up a microphone and sang the hits of the only me, only, <laughs> only me, only you. She literally thought that that's what I meant. And she starts, she goes, <laughs> and starts laughing uncontrollably. I go, no, 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 I, I do music. I, I really, and she, <laughs> and Tom had to drag her out of the room because she, she went hysterical laughing, thinking of me making these tapes, singing singing the songs, the hits of the day, and playing them on my train trip up to um, Oregon. <laughs> that's that's how big a gap there is. Like, no, 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 I, I make songs. You don't understand. Talk, talk a little bit about your cassette history. It came up recently on social media. I, I, real quick, we'll touch where you're at on social media. You're on Threads. Uh, you're on Blue Sky. Yeah, um, still on X too. Oh, still on X too, huh? One of those. <laughs> well, that's where the host is there a lot, so I can't. I know, I know. I just give you all hell. <clears throat> and well, you uh, know, love, you know, of course, X is really problematic, and I don't want to be there forever. But there's, it's somehow I've gotten my contacts down to make basically music people. So as long as it's that and not the trolls and the MAGA people, then, you know, I'm kind of like biting my tongue and staying there. But, um, you know, if, if there was ever a mass exodus, you know, if ever was, I could find all my people somewhere else, I would definitely you know, jump. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I think a lot of people are in your boat. Y'all should just all get together at the same time. And yeah, and people try, but, you know, people get scared of just coming know. with me. Who's coming with me? <laughs> yeah, people try all the, it's so funny. People will go, you know, I'm leaving this shitty, this horrible <laughs> fight. And then a week later, they're like, there they are. Hi, I'm back. You know? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. So talk, it came up in social, social media recently. Talk briefly about your history with cassettes because the this will be really cool because the interview that I had just before you, the guy's new album was coming out on cassette on a oh, label. Cool. And uh, so so it can, you know, they, they go together. Talk about your brief history with cassettes. Um, well, I started with cassettes, um, well, from as long as I can remember, as soon as I was aware, like maybe five years old, my uncle had reel-to-reel -reel machines. So I just loved tape recorders. I just had, I just really wanted to own a tape recorder. And the tape recorders at that time were tiny little, I mean, the consumer machines were little reel-to-reel -reel machines with like, I think the reels were three inches big. They were super tiny. So I owned like two or three of those. And then around 1970, these, these cassette machines appeared where like, they were incredible. They had, they were 60 minute tapes you could rewind really fast. You could f fast forward was a new thing you could do really fast. And my friend John got one, and they sat and they sounded good too. It was the quality was pretty good. So then I got one, and so those were our record labels. Like your record label is Purple Heaven, Mine's Phantom Soil, and <laughs> I recorded on those for years and years and years. And then when Porta Studios came out, I didn't get a Porta, you know, four track TX Porta Studio. I didn't get one of those. But I got a professional TAC reel-to-reel machine that I then would dub onto cassettes and then mail those out to other musicians and other uh, people. 
Mm. Uh, and then, so that's what I did until CDRs came out. So mm. if that was too fast or. <laughs> no, there, you, you skipped over the part about this being a thing though. There was like a whole thing of people mailing. Them. Right, right, right. Okay. So yeah. So we, I did this and it turned out like even people like the guided by voices guy, anybody, any musician who had cassettes would like pretend that the cassettes were albums. Like here's my new album. And even if you had only the master and then you would pass that to a friend and Oh, what'd you think of my album? That was all right. You know, but it was your album. Um, oh. So then um, there were these local radio stations in LA that would play indie cassettes. And I, I would send it to those guys and one of them said, well, there's this magazine coming out called Option, and it's for independent musicians. And, and I went, oh, my God, that sounds like something I would love. So I got the very first issue, and I opened it, and here's all these addresses of people saying, I will trade my music cassette for yours, or I my cassette costs Gnarly. $5. Yeah, and then reviews of these, I mean, reviews of these cassettes. And I'm like, oh, my God, everybody's doing this across the world. And then I thought about it and I went, well, of course they are. How could I be, how could I be the only one in the whole world? Even though that's what I thought I was. So I started writing to these people, getting tapes back. And a lot of those early ones are still my friends to this day, to this day. And, and then it just grew larger and larger. you know, then I, I got overwhelmed. I couldn't keep up with everybody, but that's, that was my original first network of people to trade music with and it's taken all these years later for it first to be x or tw i'm sorry twitter now x and then uh the indie hunt people to get like a secondary network that feels like that first one yeah i think that is just a frankly a beautiful story uh it's like snail mail social media uh, right and and I, you know, back in my day, we mailed each other songs. <laughs> yeah, we did. <laughs> you had to wait. And then you had to wait to hear if they liked it or hated it. <laughs> oh, you know, know, thank you so much for oh, coming yeah. on and 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 talking with me. I enjoy every single interaction I've ever had with you. Oh, and sorry. and. Uh, I just think you're the bee's knees, man. And uh, thanks so much for coming on the show. Well, of course. I had a great time. Thank you. And you got me out of bed. That's, that's the main thing. <laughs> <laughs> I'm going to press the button now. Okay.